All right, so hello and um, welcome everybody to the third session of our Tikkun Alam in Action EUJS Human Rights Week. My name is Gabriela Glick and I'm the AJC Goldman Fellow working with EUJS this summer. And today I'm delighted to be co-moderating this webinar alongside Maurice Kirschbaum, a researcher at Oxford University for this interesting panel discussion on anti-Black racism. Before I introduce our panelists and get started with our conversation, I'd really like to encourage everyone watching, whether on Zoom or on Facebook Live, to really get involved in this discussion by posting your question to our panelists, either on the Q&A function in Zoom or on the comment section of our Facebook live stream. We will be sure to leave time at the end for these questions so we can have a really meaningful discussion. And for those following the discussion, please use the hashtag and social media that we're using for our week-long series, and the hashtag is hashtag TOIA2020. So without further ado, we are very excited to be joined by Joda C. Joseph, a Black Jewish activist and motivational speaker based in London, and Safia A. Urabi, Vice President of SOS Fascisma, a Paris-based anti-racist organization. So thanks so much guys for joining and I'd just like to offer you the opportunity to give a brief introduction of yourself and your organization. So why don't we start with you, Josie? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jodice Joseph. Um, I'm a motivational speaker in the Jewish community. And while I was at university, I set up a motivational speaking um, social enterprise, um, helping young people with low self-esteem. I'm also very involved in specifically the Jewish community, very involved in um, setting up black societies, black Jews of color um, societies. And I just finished my degree in human geography and hope to be a teacher. So. Yeah, thank you for having me on the on the panel. Thanks so much for being here. And then Safia, if you want to take it away. Hello, everyone. So my name is Safia. I am the vice president of SOS Racism, and I am also a student in uh, international political sciences in Paris. So SOS Racism is an organization which has been created in uh, 1945. Uh, 84, sorry, in order to fight against racism, anti-Semitism and racial discriminations. And nowadays we mostly, uh, we are mostly activists, but we also inter uh, intervene in schools and we also produce a uh, activist work into the legal framework in order to fight against uh, racism, uh, all, uh, all, um, sorry, uh, into the institutional and media sphere, etc. Nice. Uh, thank you both. Um, and to get us started, um, Safia, uh, I wanted to ask you about um, specifically on advocacy. Um, and as an activist uh, in the fight against anti-Black racism, uh, what do you see as, the, as your main uh, advocacy focus? Specifically also, um, uh, I've seen a lot of videos of you uh, in the protests most recently. Um, what are we looking for? Political change, education, and I know you do a lot of work as well in interfaith. Yes, thank you. So especially on the subject of anti-black racism, uh, as an advocacy activist, etc., mostly the anti-black racism uh, take its roots on stereotypes, which has in history, uh, for example, uh, slavery, colonialism, especially in France to um, animals, uh, to um, the, uh, a lake of, inter do you hear me there? Can you hear me? It's breaking up a bit, but the, the sound is me? better than the camera. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, a lake, okay. <laughs> a lake of intelligence, um, like smile, uh, in respect of animal, etc. And there is a huge, uh, contempt uh, for black bodies, which explain the fact that, for example, racist violence are so, 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 so current, so recurrent uh, on black people. So we do advocate for black people um, uh, into the institutional sphere because there is racism into our police, but also into the economic market. For example, uh, we do have noticed that there is um, racial discrimination, especially for black people uh, into the uh, uh, 
uh, housing market, into the labor market, et cetera, et cetera. And all, all this racism have a history. However, in France, there is a huge taboo around racism and racial discriminations. And because of, it, it, uh, of this history, you know, like, um, it, there is a huge problem. And so far as, as an activist, I do fight for this, um, for, for, for this, however, because of its taboo, there is no um, enough work into the in educational sphere and also into the political sphere. Uh, for example, uh, one, one month ago, the President Macron uh, said that it could be interesting to uh, talk about ethnic data collection as if uh, there is no data around uh, racism and uh, around anti-black racism. However, it falls. Uh, we do at SOS Racism produce data. For example, we do testing in order to test the economic market. And uh, into the research area, there is the uh, ethnic data collection in order to shed light on this uh, phenomenon, which is racism. But uh, we do think that the role of the government and the role of the French government is to act and not to prove our statement. So this is our problem. Yeah, and specifically also with data collection in France and uh, the different policies around that. Yeah. Um, Jodasai, um, specifically now, to, like in, the, in, the, in a similar vein, but on your, your engagement and your, your public speaking, in the in the Jewish community, what what do you see with the focus of your message uh, when you speak to uh, to to, uh, to community members, and also right now um, with um, with what has been happening in the past few months, and with uh, the conversations, the new conversations that we've finally been having in this in these past few months, especially also in the Jewish community. Uh, thank you very much. So a lot over the last few years, a lot of my talks, a lot of my inspiration, a lot of my messages generally have been about mental health about self-esteem and about overcoming challenges. However, since the George Floyd situation, um, there has been a, a call to action. I kind of feel that um, the, the leadership kind of gets forced on you. I said uh, when I was in university and um, I didn't want to run the Jewish society, I didn't believe in myself. And there was no one else, there was no one else that could do it. So that I got forced, if it wasn't for me, there'd be no Jewish society. So I think sometimes in, in, in the world, sometimes in society, leadership gets forced upon you, roles get forced upon you. And there are voices in the black Jewish community that are there, but I felt like I had a responsibility being a motivational speaker, being a black Jew. I felt like I had a responsibility since George Floyd to actually be a voice. I felt like I could actually speak. I, I didn't think I could have a huge impact in a non-Jewish world, in the wider society, because there's so many people doing so much already. But I did feel within the Jewish community specifically, being a very small community and being very easy to access from my perspective, because I'm very involved in the Jewish community, I can now start portraying this message of, are we doing enough? Is the Jewish community in the UK, are we doing enough to make Jews of color feel welcome within the communities? Are we doing enough? And as much as I love the Jewish community and as much as I haven't let me being black stop me from practicing my Judaism and being involved in communities, there are struggles and issues that the Jewish community have with accepting Jews uh, of, of color or welcome, making them feel welcome. So my message is, you know, that even in, in Jewish history, there's been Ethiopia, there's, there's been loads of black Jews. We don't even know if Moses was black or white, you know? We don't even know if our, if our leaders, we don't know if they were black and white. And I think a lot of black history has been removed from, 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 from the Jewish history, you know, going to synagogues, um, I wouldn't hear rabbis talk a lot about the multicultural aspects of Judaism, about how there's different types of Jews. But Judaism isn't a race, it's a religion. It's an, uh, you know, anyone can, and people can join of all different colors. So my messages have basically been that there are different types of Jews and there are ways you can welcome them at security. The way, you know, I've had a lot of questions at securities of synagogues and made, 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 being told that I'm not Jewish and be told to walk away from the synagogue because of the color of my skin. I've been stared at on streets and in synagogues because of the color of my skin, you know, and, and these things don't need to happen, you know. I, and these are my messages that we can make people feel more welcome that as a, as a Jewish nation, for thousands of years, we have been persecuted against the Romans, the Greeks, the Germans with Hitler, right? 
because of our race. And therefore we have a responsibility ourselves, uh, an extra responsibility to give back and, to, and to, to, to welcome other people into our, into our communities. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, Tikkun Olam. And, um, but I, I'm wondering specifically on the, 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 the issues, for example, that you mentioned and we talked about briefly before the, the call started, on these conversations as well with security um, uh, and security around synagogues. How, how, is that, how has that conversation been happening finally now? Uh, because it's not, it's not like this issue is, uh, is, is, is very new. It's been happening for the past, um, I mean, I came to the UK 10 years ago and we had issues with racial discrimination at, uh, at, uh, at synagogues. Yeah, so I think, I, think, I think this George Floyd situation has definitely created a conversation. Like I spoke at the United Synagogue, I've done a lot of talks for different shuls and synagogues about how I felt as a black Jew attending synagogues and to do with their security. So there definitely is a wider conversation. I know the Board of Deputies in the UK have put together policies for synagogues to abide by to ensure that, because the question is, we need profiling. We do need profiling. Like security systems are made on profiling. They have to profile people. That's just part of security. But it's not about profiling about the problem. The problem is the hostility that's that is done with, you know, and the disrespect that the questioning is done with. It's not necessarily the fact they need to ask us questions and the fact they need to actually find out if we're a part of that community. I understand that. It's the hostility in which it's done. And I think etiquette, it can just be, it can be trained. And that's what we're hoping to do. That's what we're hoping the Board of Deputies are hoping to do. And I'm working with the Board of Deputies on that. I've been working with it. I've actually set up a black society for like 20, 30 black Jews in the UK to come together and to talk about these issues and to continue educating synagogues and continue having those conversations saying, like inform your, inform your security guards that there are black Jewish people, that there are Indian Jewish people, that there are Chinese Jewish people and to, and to be more open to that as opposed to like hostile and segregated. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think it's a really important conversation that needs to be had within the Jewish community. Um, you also touched a lot about hostility towards the black community and you mentioned George Floyd and the way that his murder sort of reinvigorated the conversation surrounding race. So I wanted to ask Sophia if you could talk a bit about how your organization has responded um, to the George Floyd murder and also to the sort of worldwide conversation surrounding race and blackness. Of course, thank you. So yes, the death of George Floyd um, has bring in France a feeling such as sadness, anger, and fear, because the youth in France uh, does know what the racism into the police looks like. So for us, uh, because the death of George Floyd has been filmed during the eight minutes and 46 seconds, uh, it has crystallized all these feelings and so we decided to go to the street in order to shed light the fact that there is racism into our police and that we are victim of racial discriminations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one, uh, at SPS Racism, one month before the death of George Floyd, before the murder of George Floyd, um, we have created a petition and also a sort of opinion piece which, ha uh, which have been uh, signed by a lot of uh, celebrities, organizations, and most of the time citizens, uh, in order to make the government aware on what's happening in France to the police and so far as the racism into the police. However, uh, it has been ignored by our government. And the fact that um, the murder of George Floyd um, make, make um, the citizens, the French citizens, and also our organization go to the streets, uh, make something like, oh, okay, perhaps we do have to treat uh, this issue, this contemporary issue. Um, and so the 9th June, um, at the same time of the, of the commemoration for George Floyd, we decided to uh, organize, organize um, a uh, pacific protest in Paris. Uh, in which they were uh, 12,000 persons uh, into the streets. Uh, first of all, we we want to we want wanted to commemorate the death of George Floyd, then to um, claim our support to the 
um, an entire system American which has which were not being heard enough, and also to aware about the situation in France. Um, so that was the most important aspects of our of our protest. And now we uh, we we uh, we try to organize some some act to go to the street uh, to aware people to uh, aware our, our government our uh, media etc and it was surprise surprisingly it was pretty good um, knowing the fact that for example uh, by opening this this subject of racism to the police um, starting with the anti-black racism we have a, opened a door, we have breaking the taboo, um, which concerns mo mostly racial discriminations. And I was quite surprised when like media, uh, etc. were asking to me, so, okay, so what, what, what are the racial discrimination uh, into the housing market, into, into the labor market, etc. So it likes open path, which is very interesting, but the fact that our government and our media start to talk about this phenomenon uh, should not be considered as a victory, but just as the first step of our fight. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point. So speaking of um, sort of victory, one thing I'm noticing is a kind of an interesting conflict between the way the Jewish community looks at the police and the black community looks at the police. I know Jodeci talked about um, profiling coming into synagogues, but how it's uh, kind of sort of necessary. I know when you go to a synagogue in Europe or in America, there are police guarding with guns. And it's important um, because unfortunately with the rising anti-Semitism, that is still a problem that Jews face around the world. So uh, this is kind of towards both of you. What do you see as the future of the police? Do we need to kind of have a re-education campaign where we talk about um, race in police training or what's the goal because it's kind of a hostility towards the black community while supporting the jewish community so it's not something that i think can really be done away with with the simple defunding of the police so what do you think about that josie so i just wanted to unmute myself um i think it's really hard for policemen to some extent because they have to tackle crime and they have to tackle crime and they have to restrain people and they have to do these sorts of things in their communities to stop crime. That's the whole point of police, to stop crime. And I think their challenge is going to be, how can they stop crime in a way that protects people's human rights? Because what happened with George Floyd is obviously against one's human rights. They, they restrained them and they killed the guy. And this wasn't the first case that happened. There were so many cases of that happening. And even in England, there's so many cases where people are being brood like there's been police brutality and people are being stopped you know it was the whole coronavirus there was like um 52 percent of the people that were fined and stopped by police were um were of a bame were of the bame community when that is so disproportionate to how many bame members of the community there are right so that is that is a breach of human rights how can you just say just because the color of their skin they, 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 they should be fined compared to someone who's not that color of the skin. So I think it's a matter of training policemen or, and women to, to, to tackle crime, but also not to stop every black person on the street or to stop everyone that looks dodgy, it's to also have more awareness and to, to be more intricate in the way they stop people and in the way, and not only in the way they stop people, but how they approach and they talk to a person when they're stopping them. It's more, from what I've seen is that it's been very hostile. A lot of the conversations, a lot of the way they treat people as if they're animals, you know, when they're stopping them, they, they, could, they can restrain people in much different ways. They can do it in a much subtle way, you know? And obviously, you know, about, like you said before, like you mentioned even in, when you gave in the question that it's about education. Policemen, when they're trained, they need to be educated on, how, you know, how to restrain people in a safe way, how to not, not, profile too much on like how to make sure that it's really that person who's doing that crime that needs to be stopped not just a random person walking on the street and because they're black they need to be maybe given more more i don't know too much about the policing system and how they're trained but i think there needs to be more information on how to on how to really identify those people that are really criminals as opposed to just 
anyone who looks like like what they view as what looks like a criminal. Um, so I think edu- the core is education and, and also working with communities. I think they can work with communities, work with community, work with, with Christian leaders, priests, rabbis, um, imams, work with these people and, and, and to identify their communities and get familiar with the communities. So they, so they know that, you know, their leaders will be able to say, oh, this person's not a criminal, or, you know, work more with the local communities to get on their side and, to, to, and, and help also help help people understand why you do these things. Like if I understood why you, why you stopped me, that might, that might make me feel better about it. So maybe more education on the public, maybe policemen giving more workshops to the local community to, to explain their processes of why they stop people and, and why they not, I think brutality is out of the question, but why they pro because that's obviously, that's obvious. It's obvious that brutality is terrible. Like we don't need to go into why brutality and, is bad. I think the the question is, how can we create more of an understanding of why people are getting stopped who are black? Why is that happening? Um, and that is for the policeman. That is the police department's role to educate um, everyone and the community, even online through advertising, and and really make it aware of why why I'm being stopped. Because if I knew why I was being stopped at synagogues, if it was really a danger that we that most of the people that cut that you know, there's a reason that I've been profiled because I don't look like a Jew. Or because there's not that many black Jews in the community, and we just need to make sure that would make me much. And they said that to me, that would make me much more understanding. I'd be happy to go along with it. But just to be hostile to me and make me feel unwelcome, that's the problem. If they're more, if you understand why you're being profiled and understand why you're being searched, it might create a, a more restful, kind of peaceful relationship between police and communities. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. <laughs> Um, and Sophia, if you wanted to maybe touch on that, so what are your sort of goals for the police and for the relationship between the community and the police? So I think that you found out some something very interesting, the fact that um, the relation between the, not the national community, but the communities, uh, especially black people or Jewish people to the police is different. And so for us, it creates um, a victim competition. I mean that, for example, the relationship between the black people and the police uh, is very different from the um, relationship between Jewish people and the police. Because uh, as we, as we know, um, Jewish people were the victims of um, terrorist attacks, etc., and so they are obliged to be protected by the police. However, um, for the young black people, there it is something like a little bit difficult by knowing that, okay, so Jewish people are, are protect, protected by police, but I am a victim of uh, racist violence by the police. So what's happened actually? Um, so it is a part of our fight to like um, create uh, this bond between these minorities, especially black people, Jewish people, Arab Arab people, etc. Because in our Western countries, uh, whatever we can think, a minority will always be a minority. And so for us, in order to uh, make our anti-racist fight a victory, we have to create bonds between those minorities. However, the link that a community can have with police, it is the link that um, this community have with the citizenship. So it is very preoccupant and um, uh, what I would like to to add is that um, in order to fight against the racism to the police, especially the fact that Arab people and black people are a victim of, uh, we propose like very concrete thing. However, since several years, we aren't heard enough. For example, we proposed the uh, reform of the EGPN. In France, the EGPN is the police of the police in order to control the act, etc., um, of the police. However, this EGPN is only composed nowadays by policemen. And what we demand is that this EGPN, so this police of the police, should be uh, composed of people of law and also um, people of the civil society. Moreover, we demand that uh, policemen should be uh, formed um, and should and should be exposed to classes on racism, anti-Semitism, et cetera, because uh, we know that there is a, an amount of stereotypes into the police institution. 
and that so like how to say it um the fact that uh, a policeman have a gun um and that this policeman could have stereotypes on the person um they will they will face it it can be it can have a huge consequences um so to form policemen and also to create what we call the recipice. Uh, recipice, it's a paper that, that it, will, it will be give uh, to a person which has already been controlled, uh, controlled for her identity, to make this uh, identity controlled not um, uh, discrim like to, to, to make this control not a tool of discrimination uh, anymore. Um, it, uh, it, the racial profi profiling that Jodeci uh, has talked uh, um, uh, later. Uh, so it's very po uh, important to recreate those bonds between our communities, but also to reform the police and to reform the police of the police because uh, there is a huge problem that just um, is very, very preoccupant for our entire racist point. <coughs> Very, very interesting, especially the, um, that this conversation about policing, which we're having globally, um, has also such different answers in a way. And, and I think your answers, especially with the EGPN and other things like that, really show like that there is no like one size fit all solution um, uh, in that sense. But I, I wanted to touch a, a little bit also on something that you that you um, that you touched about already a bit in your answer now, Safia. Um, when you were talking also before on the, the data gathering of, uh, of, of ethnic uh, uh, of ethnic groups and the debates that they're having in France, and there's all of these different debates on what it means to be French uh, and identity, um, which is is really fascinating uh, in the French uh, in the French system and and the way that um, France deals and is dealing currently with the um, um, with this, this this wave of anger at uh, at, uh, at these structures. Um, and I, I wanted to know, both of you represent um, multiple identities. Uh, and in, in the case of France, um, like, um, are, are, are kind of fighting also this idea of the multiple identities clashing or not being um, able to, um, to express them both because of, oh, you're either fully French or not. Um, I'm feeling that I'm, I'm convoluting this uh, a little bit. But yeah, uh, the, the main question being, how how does this reality of um, of this everyday um, complicate your sense of belonging in a society so focused on placing people into boxes? So, Safi, in your case, it would be French and 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 then not French. Um, I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but <laughs> okay. So, uh, I answer or jealousy? Okay, I'll, I'll, I will start. Um, so. Um, First of all, for example, um, the fact if I decided to uh, be uh, an activist at SOS Racism, it's because I uh, I was part I was um, uh, uh, I was taking part to a project which is called Salam Shalom Salut, because my mother is a Jewish Moroccan and my father is a Muslim Algerian, and that I'm also French. So all this complexity. Um, and the knowledge that I can have all these identities that, and by knowing that they are not opposed to each other, I know this. However, in the public debate nowadays, um, some people are trying to make this identity opposed to each other, as if you uh, cannot like be French and Muslim, be uh, a French and Muslim. Uh, be uh, French and Israeli and uh, or French and Algerian, etc, etc. Um, so this is what uh, we are fighting against. And the debate of ethnic data collection in order to fight against racism also uh, put at the center of the table uh, this debate of the identity. Um, what we are against and for at SOS Racism, it is very simple. Um, we have to know that in France, the ethnic data collection already exists into and only into the research area and sometimes into the civil society. Uh, for example, at SOS Racism, we produce what we call testings, 
uh, as I said later, to produce data to know uh, what um, wet restaurants or uh, private beach uh, are discriminated or not. So all this data around uh, the racial phenomenon and racism already exists. However, we are against um, popular census in which people um, and which citizenship would be associated to an ethnicity. And as I said, because I am mixed, but not because of that, it could be very violent. Okay, so which case I will cross? Uh, so I would like to be free to to make all this identity live together and um, fighting against um, racism. It is also that it is also the fact that no, you don't have to put people into boxes um, and the race, the racist ideas, the racist ideology uh, are based on the fact to put people into boxes to uh, create statistic to know, okay, so uh, who are the minorities which, who are occupying the most uh, the jail system, etc., in order to stigmatize these people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's like a very peasant debate. Uh, however, um, um, it is very important to to know that all this data around racism, especially around anti-black racism, which, which is a real taboo, already exists, and so. What we are fighting nowadays is like for act, for reforms, for concrete reforms, and not to just create statistics for creating statistics. Um, most of the time, some people, and it could be anti-racist people, are asking me, okay, so what are you against a popular census on the ethnic data collection? It has already exists uh, in United States, for example. Okay, but, um, I think in the United States, ethnic data collection already exists, but there is no act, there is no reform uh, to make the racism end. So what are the, okay? And so we have to, to fight against multiple phenomena, the racism, anti-Semitism, racial discriminations, the victim competition, but all this, all the things are linked and we do not have to sequence all this fight. And, and that, that leads also very, very well, um, Jodice. Um, we, we talked about it before as well. That also, this in a, in a similar vein of these, these boxing in, uh, or having to having to even explain yourself in a way, like you mentioned as well, before going into the synagogue, um, uh, tell your story every time, uh, tell you to explain yourself, explain your multiple identities. Um, as someone British, as uh, as a Jew, as an African, um, could you could you could you tell us about that and specifically yeah. navigating these in, in the Jewish context? Then? Yeah, so I actually really relate to Sophia on the point that you know my mum's Jewish um, from London, and my dad's uh, not Jewish; he's Christian from Nigeria. So, so like I already understand that there's my, my identity is a bit more complex than I'd say the average Jew in the UK. And I also do agree with Sophia when she when she mentions her whole idea of um, boxes being like boxes are a kind of foundation to discrimination. Meaning, it's a big it's one big illusion in, in life in in society. There's an illusion that if someone looks different to us, or someone has a different ethnicity, or someone has a different race, or someone has different clothes, or some that they're separate to us. As a religious Jew, I have a big belief that we're all one. When we say Shema Yisrael, Shem Echad, that we're all one. Every 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 person, every society, we're all one. We're all one being, right? And the minute society starts to create boxes and and labels on people of their identities, it is contradictory to that idea of us being one. Because if we're one, I'm like you. I'm you, and you're me. And therefore, I have love. Like I have love for you, like I have love. I have love for me. But if we're separate now, I, I don't. You are you, and I am me, and I no longer need to care for you as much as I care for me. And in fact, you're a minority, you're lower than me, and therefore I treat you lower. And therefore, in society, the minute they start putting people into boxes, the minute they start putting people into, 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 into separate boxes and saying that these are white people that 
white people are here, black people are here, African people, and you start putting them in different places, then that creates this, other, this idea called an othering. They start to become others and people start to become others and that leaves room for racist and discriminatory behaviors. Me, in my Jewish identity, I, I'm a proud black African Jew, very, very proud. And I have felt growing up that I've had to justify myself being black and Jewish. Meaning that there's a tension between me being Jewish, which is a religion, and me being black, which is a color. That they don't, they, they shouldn't contradict because the religion is a religion and, and that's to do with ideology and spirituality and how you identify in terms of thought and, and behavior. And color of your skin is to do with literally the pigmentation of your skin, the amount of, um, me, me, what's it called, melan, melan, like the, melan, the, the sort of chemical that you have in your skin, the melanin that you have in your skin, they're completely different things. What your ideology is and what you believe and stuff in your, in your spiritual DNA is very different to your physical and what you look like. And therefore, I have a big issue with having to struggle with this because one's my, one's my color of my skin and African and like where I'm from, and one's my religion and what I value in terms of um, values and model. Uh, and, and therefore I don't think they should even contradict on, on at all in general, but however society, British society, it being a mostly white society has made me start to doubt my Judaism and me being black and doubt, you know, who I am in the Jewish world. Because Judaism, the Jewish population in the UK, I did, my I did my dissertation on the Jewish community in the UK, and it's mostly Ashkenazi. They came from Eastern Europe, and a lot of the Jewish people in the UK are Ashkenazi. And, and the other Jews, either Sephardi, Mizrahi, Moroccan, you know, different types of Jews. But then I'm an African Jew, so I, don't, I find it hard to, I don't even fit into the boxes of the Jewish community. And I'm an Ashkenazi African Jew because my mum is actually like, so it gets more and more complicated and throughout my life I've, I'm very lucky that I'm a confident person that I believe in myself that I can walk into a room and walk into a space and feel comfortable anyway but even though I've still, I'm a confident person I've still made to I've still been made to feel uncomfortable because of these boxes because I don't have a box necessarily in the Jewish community that I fit in but I'm generally trying to f squeeze myself into a different box and therefore, I feel like at some points I've had to leave behind my African identity, that I've had to put aside my African identity to fit in to the Ashkenazi community. So that's one thing I found really difficult is pushing away a part of me subconsciously. I've kind of attached myself to my Ashkenazi Jewish identity and left behind my African, my, my, I don't want to associate my blackness with African, but my African identity I've had to put to the side. Um, so th that's one of the struggles that I've had and, and this is what the boxes have kind of caused me to do as an individual. And I've spoken to other black Jews in the UK and they feel the same, that, that they, they can't be themselves fully because of the cultural, the cultural ideology, the cultural characteristics of the Jewish community in the UK. I don't know what the Jewish community is like in France, or maybe in France there's more Sephardis, because I know I, I know I feel connected to Sephardis because of the color of my skin. I can relate to more to Sephardi sometimes, but I don't know what the French community, I've got French friends who are Sephardi, but I don't know what the, what Sophia goes through on a daily basis in the Jewish community, if she's still, if you are involved in the Jewish community um, in France. Um, so uh, can I answer to, <laughs> to you? Yeah, why not? I just I thought I'd... Uh, yes, uh, no, it's very, very interesting, I guess. Uh, the, um, the, biggest part of the Jewish community in France is Sephardic people. So I am a Sephardic Arab person, but also <laughs> French. However, uh, it like it is quite weird because, but not really actually, my parents um, have created a sort of distance between um, the Jewish community and me, but also with the Muslim community and me. So now that I am 19 years old, so it's like just nowadays that I am creating these links and so it's like quite pleasing because I am just um, taking what um, what I feel great into the Jewish community, what I feel great into the Muslim community, etc. because I was not uh, obliged to, in, to be involved into this community. However, sometimes it could be like quite um, weird and quite uh, 
quite hurtful. Uh, for example, there is anti-Semitism into the Muslim community and there is anti-Arab racism into the uh, Jewish community, especially in France, because between Sephardic people and Arab people, there is a passionate relationship which has been, which take its root into the um, North Africa, but also into the Middle East and nowadays in Western Europe. So yes, it's quite complicated, but this is why I talk uh, later about the project, the Salam Shalom Salut project. It was a project which reunited um, a dozens of young people, um, and the aim was to reunite uh, young Arabs and young Jewish people uh, who who uh, were uh, friends, French, sorry, at first, in order to. Uh, make uh, to to go to all the biggest city in France uh, to make and to create a dialogue between the French Jewish community and the French Muslim community. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. So you've talked a bit about um, your work in the interfaith interfaith project. And we wanted to focus a little bit more on coalition building because both of you represent such a multitude of identities. Um, so what do you see as the value of building coalition and allyship between different groups? You talked a bit about your project working with the Arab and Jewish community in France. So maybe Joe to see if you could talk about what it means to connect to both or multiple sides of your identity. So yeah, I just want to first of all say that um, I did an event a few weeks ago, an interfaith event, a panel, and I was with a, a priest and I was with an imam and there was me. And it's very, very interesting because you would think that the problem of racism occurs solely like in the Jewish community, you know, as it's mostly white, you, there's not a lot of diversity within the Jewish community in the UK. But actually, it seems to be that in the Christian community and the Muslim community, there's also, they have a lot of struggles of racism within their own communities. Um, that the, on this call there was a black imam who said that, that that black Muslims they get a lot of racism from their own Muslim community. They have a they have a they have a mosque specifically for black Muslims because the, the a lot of black Muslims that don't feel comfortable in their communities. The Christ, the lady who was a priest who was a black priest said that as me, there's many sects of Christianity that is mostly white dominate mostly white don't do not dominated. Right, and then a lot of black Christians feel uncomfortable going to their synagogues, and a lot of white Christians feel comfortable to go in certain black, um, black, um, not synagogues, black um, churches. So there, there's a such value in speaking to other communities because through this call, we can learn from other Islam, Islamic communities, Christian communities. First of all, the value is we can learn from them on how to deal with our own community. What they were saying is, although it's very great that to, to work with other communities, they realize that there's so many problems within their own community as well, that although it's great that we're doing a lot of that we're doing these events, what we can learn from these events, nevertheless, what we can learn from these events is what we can do in our own community, what we can learn from other communities to work in our own, to work, to work within our own community. Second of all, by building coalitions, by working with other communities, different races, different communities, we are already showing, we are already tackling, we're already tackling this whole idea of racism. Because if we're willing as a race, as a religion, to, to work with other races and religion, that in itself is a message, that in itself is a, is a, is a testimony to solidarity. And therefore, if we, the two things, so the two things I'm trying to say is one, we can learn how to work with our own community and how to remove and, and completely take out of, um, take out racism from our communities. We can learn from other communities on how they're doing it. And two, by working with other communities to tackle racism, that in itself is a way of, of, of showing solidarity and showing that we are together to fight racism. And, and, that, and that, will, that, that will show that we're not individuals, that we're not boxes, that we're all one. This idea of echad, this idea of oneness, this idea of that we're all together. And if we work with other communities, it removes the stigma, it removes this whole fear that oh, I can't work with that community because they're racist to my community. What Sophia was saying before about, you know, in France, I don't know about, in the UK, I hear a lot of, from Jewish people, a lot of Islamophobia, a lot of, um, a lot of comments from people about Muslims. And, and the way we can tackle that racism is by working with Muslim communities. But people, people aren't inherently racist. People are, 
I really do believe that racism is driven by fear. And if I'm scared of another community, if I don't know what another community is about, if I don't know about them, therefore I reject them and therefore I, I'm racist towards them. And I do think a lot of Jewish people aren't racist to Muslim people because they're, they've got our evidence based. It's because, there's, it's because they don't know that community. They don't know Muslim people. They haven't got friends that are Muslim. They haven't got friends that are Christians. So for us to work with other communities, for the Jewish communities to work with other communities, it will remove this fear. It will remove this racism naturally, right? Because we're building solidarity. And so that they're my two main points is that it will, one, it will, it will inform us, it will give us information, that it will give us value on what we can do to take out racism in our own communities, learning from others. But number two, it will create a unity amongst communities and remove and actually tackle racism by the actual idea of, co of, of forming coalitions of, and, and working with other communities. Yeah, so thank you for that answer. I think that was really, really insightful. Um, I think now we're gonna move on to the Q&A session. If you have anything to add, Sophia, on that. Uh, oh, yes, okay, I can, I can uh, answer to the question and then pass to the Q&A. Um, so what I would like to, to say that at SFS Racism, um, I am, we are not specialists of the uh, interfaith bond, et cetera, because uh, when you fight, especially on the on subjects such as uh, racism, anti-Semitism, and racial discrimination, you are more into a cultural aspect, into uh, color skins, into origins, uh, into the history of migrations, etc. However, um, as a as a Jewish woman, also my and uh, my Jewish identity is more based on the fact that I. I am a part of a people. So the religious aspect is like a little bit far, far away from, uh, from us, but not totally disconnected. And I would like to make a link between um, the Jewish community, because we are into the EUDS, and also the anti-Black racism. Because at SOS Racism, we noticed that there is a common stereotype uh, um, about um, on how um, the black memory and the, the Jewish memory are um, are uh, teached to people. Uh, for example, uh, in France, uh, we are used to teach that um, black slaves were passive in front of slavery, and um, most of the time. Uh, we are taught that Jewish people were passive in front of Nazis, in front of Hitler, and in front of um, extermination, um, forgetting that they were black uh, slaves revolt. They, they were uh, Haiti. Um, they were the war of the Varsovie ghetto, etc. So. Uh, nowadays, uh, the Jewish mem memory and the black memory has a common point, the fact that they have a common point, the fact that they are um, that Jewish people and black people uh, are described as passive people. Uh, so we have to fight ag against those false ideas and by fighting against those, all those false ideas, we can clearly create bonds between this community. And as I said late, um, later, is that a minority was, will, will always be a minority, um, as Jewish people can know that by living in diaspora before the creation of Israel. And so forth, we have to create bonds with our minorities, with our community, just in order to make one, in order to fight against racism. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and uh, as, uh, Gabriella mentioned, we uh, we sadly have to um, to move into our curator. Okay, sadly for, for me, because I, I, I wanted to talk more about this and have more questions. Uh, but many other people have questions. Um, so um, for our first question, uh, Lior uh, Smith asks, um, how do you intend to encourage members of minority communities to become politically active, especially in light of increasing efforts from fascist entities to bully and threaten diverse voices. 
I think, uh, Jodeci, if you, if you, um, if you want to start us off on that, especially since, um, you also, um, became very active now and, 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 and came also to talk to us here about this, but, um, this, yeah. this, this was also in a way thrown up on you. Yeah. So it's really interesting because I, I would never have called myself political before this. <laughs> I would never, I was never really involved in politics. I did a lot of motivational speaking. I was very like, diplomatic in what I spoke about is very much about self-esteem you know you don't really have arguments with people about how to improve your self-esteem and things like that so having to start talking about politics and start to starting to talk about matters that are quite a hot topic that can cause quite a lot of confrontation the first thing I would say is to do research do some research look online look on statistics look on government websites Really get your facts right. Really try and gain an understanding. Like I listened to a lot, before I did my first talk, I listened to a lot of podcasts. I obviously had a lot of my own opinions, but I listened to a lot of podcasts, you know, from different people. I looked on government websites. I watched Question Time, UK Question Time to see what the government was doing about the matters. I was I was listening to both right, far right and far left um, voices. So first of all, if you want to get more political active and you're not normally political, um, first of all, do your research. First of all, do your research. and and educate yourself. Secondly, I know I know there's certain movements that are having um, anti-Semitic, putting out anti-Semitic tweets, and there are def there are definitely things. I would first of all say you don't have to um, agree. You don't have to put yourself in line with those movements if you don't agree with the fundamental foundation of the anti-Semitism. You can you can still talk about Black Lives Matter from your own perspective. You can you can write politically about you coming from you or looking for other organisations that have less or don't have any anti-semitic um ideologies that go along with it what i always say to final to finalize the end of this question is say that we all have a sphere of influence it could be our family members it could be our friends it could be our local community it could we all have a sphere of influence people we can influence and therefore what i would say to you is if you really want to make a difference without getting too involved with people who are offending you start with your local community start with your friends start with at your dinner table friday night shabbat dinner start the conversation you know bring some facts do a video on facebook do something on instagram coming from you start with you i, I know we've got a short time so i'm just i want to give it over to yeah thank you Safia, um a similar question on um on how to get um communities or minority members of communities to become more politically active um, first of all, the entire uh, entire racist subject is uh, it is at the center of all subjects by meaning that I think that we cannot talk about other subjects such as economy etc. If people uh, are, aren't equal actually, and and uh, the fact that people of minorities could be uh, could make themselves involved into politics political subject, et cetera, such as anti-racism, is the fact that anti-racism uh, do uh, create a huge interest because especially in France and I think in Western Europe and most of the countries, the extreme right-wing extremism uh, is at the door of the power. And um, fascist people uh, are killing people nowadays um, in Pittsburgh because they are Jewish, uh, in uh, Christchurch because they are Muslim, in San Diego because they are migrants, uh, in Canada because they are women, in other countries because they are homosexuals, etc., etc. Because there's fascist people do believe in what we call the great reemplacement and the great reemplacement is a horrible belief in which all the minorities that they, that who are not considered as white should be killed etc etc so once again it shows the necessity to create bonds between um, our communities uh, and not just our minorities uh, communities, but also with white people, etc., whatever the color of the people, because anti-racism is a project of society. And by society, we, we understand that all people should be included because 
far-right extremism, Islamism, etc., are belief that if I consider you as different, so I have the right to death or life um, on you. So this is why, once again, it is important to create bonds and to fight against the fact that far-right extremism is at the door of the power in our countries. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really good answer as to why coalition building is so important for us right now. Um, I'd like to move on to one more question. This question is from Olaf Stando, and he asks, how important is it to teach the lessons on the legacy of slavery and colonialism and its effect on contemporary racism? And how can these discussions be most effectively conveyed in Jewish circles? So Jodeci, maybe if you wanna start talking about that. I'll say, yeah, history History is the solution to, to stop things reoccurring again. You know, this idea of never never forget, uh, this idea of never forget the Holocaust, for example. You know, if we constantly understand what the Holocaust was and how why it happened, that would create an understanding and create education to stop it happening again. The same with slavery and colonialism. Obviously, now it's so widely not accepted. Colon I studied it in geography, uh, geopolitics. Colonialism today is, is, is so widely um, not accepted. But if we didn't learn about what it was, who knows, it maybe could reoccur. If we didn't know that this was a thing, it could have reoccurred. So I think it's, first of all, it's really, really important that we, uh, we learn and we educate ourselves to make yourself aware, not to, not to put down the previous generations and to say they're horrible people, because we don't know, we weren't in that generation. We don't know what it was like then, and we don't know what it was like to be in that situation. But to say, no, this can't happen again. And this and, and 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 for us to learn the processes of how it happened and how it came about would allow us to understand the formations of why of why of how it could not happen again. And if we see the phases happening again, we can stop it in its tracks. Number two, how can we mostly effectively do, it, do this in Jewish circles? I'll say it's best to come from people who are who are who are black, um, who to talk about these things. I think obviously. People who are white can educate their communities about these things, like leaders, religious leaders. But I also think it's important to get people like me or other black Jews in the UK or different black Jews to come in and talk about their experiences of being black in the community, their history. It might make it more real and more educational for the young people and for the, and for the community to hear more from black Jews. So instead of just saying that there's, there's this black history, but also we have here someone representing that black history. I heard an amazing quote just to finish off that slavery was an interruption to black history. Meaning we're so focused, we spend so much focus on, oh, black history is just slavery. And we forget all of the amazing things that black people have done for thousands of years, like how much black people have brought to society. We don't talk about how, you know, Nelson Mandela and how all the, what black people have done and, and contributed to society. Um, so I think it, slavery is important, learning about slavery is important, learning about colonialism is important, but also I'm a big believer that these messages, if we keep on talking about colonialism and slavery, it just view, it just makes black people kind of vic like viewed as victims the whole time. Like, oh, that, that, that's what that's the, the lens they're seen through is slavery. Like if, if something bad happened to me in my life and everyone kept on reminding me of my, of my bad thing in my life and constantly talked about it, I would be viewed through these bad things. However, if you talk about it as a part of my history, or talk about the other good things that black people have done, it might create a better image and less stereotypes for people to view black people. So I think it's important to teach about colonialism a lot. But I think it's also important to talk about other aspects of black history and take and help black people be viewed in a better, in a, in a, not a victim mentality, but you know we're strong and we have a lot to bring to the table. Yeah, I think that's a really important conversation that needs to be had. And also just within the Jewish community and discussions surrounding Holocaust, when people, non-Jews, think of Judaism and Jews nowadays, I think the first thing that comes to their mind are the Holocaust, the Israeli-Palestinian yeah. conflict, and anti-Semitism. And Judaism and the Jewish community is so much more than that. So it's a really difficult balance between fighting against this evil of anti-Semitism or fighting against anti-Black racism while also promoting Black voices and Black contribution to society. You also talked a lot about um, education and history. So I think the history conversation is a really interesting and topical one right now because I know in the US we're talking a lot about bringing down statues and um, kind of taking away history from the public sphere is also a worry that's come up. So Sophia, what do you think about 
the whole toppling of statues conversation and where should we be seeing our answer? And also if you have anything else to add about our previous question on education. Thank you very much, Gabriela. So yes, to first of all, talk about the aid division. It's of course a central point of the entire assist uh, fight because all this question of history memory are inherent of the entire assist fight. More, moreover, there is a, our challenge is how to make the, the memory of each community dialogue with each other. Because in France, uh, there is a sort of victim competition in which uh, we can hear uh, people say, say uh, oh, uh, the show are off. No, we, we, talk, we, we are talking too much of this, but not enough of my, uh, of my suffer, of the suffer of my grandparents, of colonialism, of slavery, etc. And sort of competition as if we were supposed to talk less about the Shoah in order to talk more about the other crimes. However, um, those dialogues are not uh, linked to each other. It's not because you will talk less by the, of the Shoah that you will talk more about colonialism, for example. If you talk less about the Shoah, you will just talk less about the Shoah. And this is very, very uh, grave and preoccupant. So our challenge is how to create dialogue be between those uh, between those memories and to make understand people that the Shoah is also your history. Uh, colonialism is also the history of the Jewish people. Slavery is the history of black people, Jewish people, and also white people and whatever the color of the skin, because it concerns humanity and that the never forget uh, catchphrase has to be applied, especially in our context of uh, racism, far right extremism, um, et cetera. So it is a real challenge uh, into the educational sphere and your question of history, the status, et cetera. So it is something that we also see in France, the destruction of uh, statue and that people uh, were destroying statues because they can represent um, slavery, colonialism, et cetera. So first of all, we have to question, we have to, um, the first question is like, why the status uh, has been um, has been uh, has been created. Okay, so if it is because um, it, it, if it was to honor slavery or to honor Nazism or to honor colonial, colonialism, it is a problem. But if this person, um, uh, uh, but if the status represent a person for its um, books, for example, for its literature, even if um this person um were a little bit um how can i say this a little bit uh inclined with slavery so it is a question to pose so perhaps in this case the statue should not be uh destroyed by knowing that the fact that statues are are um are destroyed etc it is a, a real debate and even if we can not be, we, so we don't agree, we don't agree with this uh, with the, with this way of debating. We have to understand that this is a real debate. And at SOS Racism, and of course me, we do think that it is more important to be into a creation process instead of a destroy process. And so forth. If you want to be into the memorial debate you have to create and not to destroy because when you destroy you open a path to forget so this is why for example um this night <laughs> so okay you are supposed to know but it doesn't matter we uh how can i say this in english we stick at the wall how can you say it like um huge uh, um huge figures of um, Jewish resistant, uh, Arab resistant, um, uh, black people resistant of, against slavery in order to make them present into the public space because they are not 
present enough. However, we do not destroy. We are created, creating something in order to be present into the memorial debate. I was trying to look for the word as well, my uh, placade or yeah, um, yeah, also not my native language. Um, but, uh, but thank you both. Um, we've run, we've run over time already. Um, but I'm, I'm very glad we did. Um, and, uh, unfortunately that was the last question we had time for, but I'd like to thank you both, um, Jodasai and Safia for, for, for your time, for your contribution. Uh, it's also great to see youth voices, um, talking about this in such, a in such a pertinent manner. Um, learning from your experiences in France and in the in the UK, um, and especially uh, on this idea of coalition building voices, not having this victim competition. Uh, and I picked up as we, we talked about never again uh, a few times. Right, it came up, and this is also something that uh, EUJS is doing something about right now with the campaign "Never Again" right now uh, to stand up for this um, because just saying never again. Uh, and remembering our past uh, or the Shoah isn't isn't enough, and there's uh, there's things to be done uh, at this very instant. Um, and I think this talk has, has really shown the need to boost dialogue uh, on this uh, on this issue. Um, and yeah, so so thank you again both for for taking the time uh, for talking to us, uh, for talking with us, um, for teaching us. Um, and EUJS is active. Uh, on many of these uh, anti-racist issues, and uh, we will no doubt uh, be in contact with you in the future, um, should any actions, campaigns, or initiatives that we're planning uh, and that are relevant to, uh, to all of us. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to thank you uh, also for those who turned into Zoom and to Facebook for the discussion and for all of the questions. We're sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, and uh, our next in the program, Tikkun Olam, in action session is tomorrow at the same time, six o'clock European time, uh, five o'clock um, UK time on Facebook Live. And it's a discussion on issues facing refugees. Um, and there'll be a panel discussion, including uh, Rachel Levitan, um, who is the VP of international programs for HIAS, um, Alexandre de Chalut, policy officer at the EU representation of the UN Refugee Agency, uh, Member of Parliament Eric Marcar and Feyaz. Dawladin, who is um, uh, um, uh, a refugee herself uh, and currently in Sweden. Um, so we look forward to seeing um, many of you tomorrow and uh, at the same time, same place. Um, and uh, we hope you have a good evening. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much.